This is Reimagining World Order, a feature podcast of the Reimagining World Order research community at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies at Princeton University. I'm Tolia Levshin, a postdoctoral fellow with the community. This podcast is jointly hosted by John Eikenberry, our research director, Chika Tanuka, a fellow postdoc, and me. On this podcast, We engage eminent scholars of world order in probing conversations about their intellectual journeys, research, and takes on our present discontents. Whether you're a professional student of international relations or a casual spectator of world affairs, our podcast aims to provide you with thought-provoking perspectives on world order from some of the world's leading minds. This is our inaugural episode. Chika, who is our guest today? Today we have Richard Foucault. Richard is the Emeritus Albert Milburn Professor of International Law and Practice at Princeton. He is the author and co-author of more than 20 books on world order, including The Pathbreaking, This Endangered Planet, Prospects and Proposals for Human Survival, published in 1971, A Study of Future Worlds, 1975, as well as more recently, Power Shift, on the New Global Order, which was published in 2016. At Princeton, Richard led the American chapter of the World Order Models Project, an international collaboration among scholars looking to illuminate a more just and humane world order and define the political steps leading towards it. Beyond Princeton, Professor Fawkes served on the United Nations Human Rights Inquiry Commission for the Palestinian Territories and as United Nations Rapporteur on Palestinian Human Rights. Interested listeners should check out his blog, Global Justice in the 21st Century. Thanks, Chika. And now, let's turn it over to John. Take it away. So we're really happy to have uh, Richard Falk on the line and to have this opportunity to, for a wide ranging conversation about his professional work and his scholarship and both his uh, trajectory, journey, if you will, intellectually and his thoughts coming from uh, earlier decades into the current period. And Dick, I, I guess this is a good time for you to reflect on your thinking over the decades because you have just completed, I understand, a, a memoir, is that is that right? Yes, it's a kind of political memoir where I do try to deal with some of these issues that the three of you have raised in uh, this list of questions that you uh, sent to me in advance of our uh, conversation. And it's an interesting time, of course, historically to think about uh, what's happening in the world and what its implications for the future are. Absolutely. What what uh, prompted you to to embark on such a, uh, a, a kind of daunting uh, self reflection? I would never have done it had I realized how daunting it would be. <laughs> uh, it's the hardest thing by far I've ever tried to write, and I only recommend it to those with uh, a stronger. Uh, a stronger kind of moral toughness, I guess, than I had. I mean, it's you find how difficult it is to to balance uh, truthfulness and sensitivity to the feelings of others. And uh-huh. I found that the most uh, challenging part of it. The intellectual parts were less challenging. Mm-hmm. When when uh, will the uh, book appear? Uh, well, publishers these days are a bit unreliable, and uh, I just don't know. I think early 2021, it's in the final st- pre-proof stage, and uh, I think they're trying to make it come out as soon as possible. That's wonderful. Well, we look forward to it. And it's a great way uh, to start our conversation today, really, a, a kind of bibliographical kind of beginning. And uh, really, the first question that I'll ask before I turn over to my colleagues is really the the very first uh, question about how you got into this business, or or to put it otherwise, 
what triggered your interest in perhaps college or in that era uh, of, of your interest in law and politics? What, what put you on this particular pathway? Well, that is a question that somewhat mystified me in the uh, uh, writing the memoir as well. I, I had a family background in which uh, my father was a lawyer and also somewhat politically engaged in a, as a uh, very strong enthusiast for the Navy and a kind of traditional uh, militarism, I guess, or patriotism at least. And he was also the lawyer for some of the leading anti communists of the uh, early uh, pre Cold War uh, years, including Alexander Kerensky, the interim prime minister of Russia. So I was sort of surrounded uh, by law and politics, but I didn't like everything about it. And my father was not very happy being a lawyer. So I had a lot of ambivalence, both uh, politically and in terms of law and a somewhat a uh, troubled childhood in a kind of traditional way. My parents were divorced when I was very young and I stayed with my father and uh, my sister was mentally institutionalized from a very young age, my very young age, she was eight years older than I was. And that cast a kind of shadow over our uh, my early life. So. I had a, I think what the consequence of all this was to have a very prolonged uh, adolescence. And it took me a long time to figure out what uh, really I wanted to do for myself and not be influenced by this uh, early background in uh, growing up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tolia, do you want to? Yes, um, I would like to take us back for a moment to those early years when you began to craft an independent intellectual identity for yourself. You did your undergraduate in economics at Wharton, graduating in 1952, and then completed the Bachelor of Laws at Yale before going on to earn a doctorate in law at Harvard, graduating in 1962. In the course of that education, did you recall coming across any thinkers or arguments that left a durable impression on your imagination, or any that, at least in retrospect, you can now say defined your subsequent intellectual trajectory? Uh, yes, uh, I was very uh, uh, somewhat unconventional in terms of the trajectory, but I was very influenced by a uh, series of courses I took with a man named Edward Aubrey in the, uh, basically the philosophy of religion. And uh, I think that uh, oriented me toward uh, a kind of uh, European existential uh, thinking at the time that, that uh, uh, oriented me a little bit away from uh, mainstream American legal and political thought. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I was also, uh, I came late to appreciate uh, uh, humanities, and I was also quite influenced as an undergraduate by uh, some literature and philosophy courses, particularly a graduate course in Aristotle that I uh, took. But uh, so that was all kind of... Uh, not very relevant background, but when I went to law school, I was very much influenced by uh, Myers McDougall, who was uh, one of the principal uh, jurisprudential figures in international law, and in a sense, in law for a uh, what they were calling a free society. He was collaborating both in teaching and scholarship at that time with Harold Laswell, who was among the most uh, uh, influential and creative uh, sociologists of that period. And it was very stimulating for me as a way both of finding my own intellectual path and 
uh, not following a vocational law path. See, I was trying, I was in law school, but I didn't want to be a lawyer. And uh, even at Yale, that was uh, a challenge of sorts. And I ended up uh, uh, influenced by McDougall, but also by a uh, philosopher who was on the faculty named F.S.C. Northrop, who wrote a book called The Meeting of East and West, that was very uh, uh, much discussed in that period and tried to make a argument that became again relevant with Samuel Huntington's ideas about clash of civilizations uh, because he was trying to argue that the future of uh, world peace or world a, a tolerable world order was an intercivilizational understanding. And he was one of the first thinkers, at least, that I had encountered that uh, argued against this kind of Western ideological hegemony that was very prevalent after the end of World War II. And it, uh, he, he led me to be, uh, become very interested in the law of India and I actually studied Sanskrit while I was in law school, which was a bridge too far because it uh, <laughs> was the hardest thing I've ever tried to do. And there were only two other students who were linguistic students and much more gifted in learning languages than I was. And it, it uh, met five times a week and practically uh, uh, destroyed me forever. But uh, <laughs> at, the, at the end of law, I followed this path of interests and I had, I was given a Fulbright to uh, India to continue this study of the law of India. But at, at that moment, uh, late in the spring, uh, the U.S. State Department decided they would punish India for not uh, paying for some uh, PL 480 wheat that it had purchased from the U.S. by canceling the Fulbright program for that year, uh, which was a rather silly way of punishing a large foreign state, but it was quite it had quite an impact on me because I had I I didn't look for any alternative employment, and I had actually been offered to be a clerk of a judge that I had declined because of this Fulbright. Uh, and I, I was really at my wit's end as to what to do when it turned out McDougall, this uh, professor who had exerted this influence, uh, called me and said that a, uh, a professor of international law at Ohio State University in Columbus had suddenly gotten ill and they were desperate to find someone to uh, teach the course because students had already registered and they considered it an important part of their curriculum. And uh, so it was purely by chance. I had never thought of an academic future for myself. I had gone through as far as high school, not being a very good student. And I didn't have that imaginary, that uh, academic imaginary. But as soon as I got to Ohio State, I felt uh, rather immediately clear that this was the future that uh, I would hope, I hope would work out uh, and that it was right for me. And, turned out I, I managed to continue on this path until almost now. So the path that you walked from your final years in graduate school to your first posting at Ohio State University was hardly a straight line. It took many contingencies and no small measure of good fortune for you to get to that destination. Uh, I guess you could say in that sense, your story can serve as uh, inspiration to graduate students who find themselves on the market today. Yeah, of course, it, it was this, uh, I guess, 
uh, misfortune of this guy who I later became good friends with, uh, that he got ill, but it, it turned out that his misfortune was my great good fortune. Uh, and that, of course, sometimes, that's another kind of thing that sometimes happens. You never know what, uh, what good and bad things will bring uh, on the following uh, day, so to speak. To move on to a slightly later phase of your career, um, much of your work, of course, has centered on the study of world order. And you presided over the American chapter of the World Order Models Project, uh, or WOMP for short, during the Cold War. So firstly, how do you understand the term world order? And was the use of the term already widespread in public and academic discourses when you started the project? Or was it something that you and WOMP propagated very consciously? Uh, that's a uh, interesting question, Sheikha, uh, particularly because at the time we uh, decided upon this terminology of world order, it was not so much in use uh, as it later, later evolved as part of the uh, intellectual vocabulary of uh, realist thinkers like uh, Henry Kissinger, for instance. But at the time we adopted it, we thought of it as a way of bringing uh, values into the study of uh, international relations and as a contrarian move in relation to uh, uh, realism uh, that was the uh, prevailing uh, academic paradigm and the prevailing interstate way of thinking about uh, international relations uh, associated with such figures as Hans Morgenthau and uh, George Kennan at that time, who were very skeptical about the raw, uh, introducing uh, legal and moral considerations into the uh, inquiry, and that's what the core of our uh, undertaking really was. How do we make uh, the world do better? What? How can we uh, uh, use our educational and intellectual, and in some sense political uh, motivations uh, to uh, exert a positive reformist? Uh, influence, or uh, I suppose uh, more accurately, a transformational impact. And we saw this as a way of separating ourselves from mainstream IR thinking and uh, foreign policy uh, orientations, particularly uh, in the West. And I think that... Uh, but later on, as I say, the uh, more uh, realist, some of the more realist uh, leading personalities uh, also gravitated toward this terminology, uh, but did so in a way that anchored it much more in geopolitics uh, than uh, we did in the WAMP project. That's a fascinating conceptual trajectory. Just can I just uh, follow up on that, Dick? Uh, just kind of just some. Uh, do you have some uh, memories of uh, sort of the specific kind of turning point, or sort of where where this kind of project crystallized uh, the WAMP project uh, uh, intellectually, or in a kind of setting with your peers, uh, your interlocutors debating these questions. This is obviously in the 1970s, there's, you've done this in, in dangerous, endangered planet. You've, you're, we're seeing the kind of environmental movement, the kind of a, a new kind of globe, global vision of, of the world as a whole. So you're amidst all of that, what, what was kind of, was there a crystallizing moment where this, conceptualization and this kind of project was kind of seen as the obvious next move. Uh, yes, John, I think that there, there, I'd mentioned two crystallizing moments. The first was while I was a, a student at Harvard 
and became friendly with uh, Saul Mendlevitz mm. and a, an Egyptian international law professor that you may have heard of, George Abi Saab who in some ways uh, turned out to be the most interesting uh, international law person with a third world uh, background. Uh, Saul, Saul ha it was really uh, an idea that uh, he uh, gave the original impetus to, but in a very different way than what uh, emerged later on. He had access to funds uh, through the enthusiasm for world government uh, that a, uh, a guy that had made a lot of money on Wall Street mm. was eager to promote. And, and their idea was that the only way you would build the political foundation for world government would be to interest uh, other uh, main uh, regions of the world in this kind of vision of a, a new world order, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and he gave uh, Saul, th this uh, uh, financier, a man named Harry Hollins, who in turn had been influenced by uh, a man named uh, Grendel Clark, who was a very Yes, a uh, rich and successful uh, lawyer who teamed with a Harvard professor, Louis Sohn, to write World Peace Through World Law, yes. which was a, uh, a quite uh, important book in, uh, published initially, I think, in the mid-60s. And their idea was, uh, as I say, it was not my idea, but it was their idea was that you needed this kind of uh, project and and participation from other uh, civilizations, other parts of the world, uh, to create a political foundation for the promotion of world government. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to sell world government, and Saul was given the uh, mission of going around the world and identifying the most uh, influential, receptive. Uh, uh, intellectuals or scholars mm. uh, that might be willing to participate in this kind of undertaking. Mm -hmm. So that was the uh, uh, initial uh, crystallization. And he did an excellent job of finding uh, people who had a real uh, world reputation in their own societies and uh, had uh, were very well respected, influential, and intellectually uh, interesting. And so the uh, part of the attraction of WAMP were that, were that its semi-annual meetings were very stimulating discussions between uh, leading intellectuals from different parts of the world, different ideological backgrounds and uh, intellectual traditions and so on. But what it turned out was that Saul was the only person that was an advocate of world government <laughs> in the project, and uh, that there was very and and that the project very early broke down into sort of a Western preoccupation with doing something about the Cold War agenda and war prevention and a real concern with war peace issues and the uh, and the, the non-western participants being in different ways uh, interested in uh, uh, economic cultural and political development mm -hmm. of uh, the newly decolonized world and it's important that for the these non-Western participants, uh, decolonization and development were more uh, preoccupying for them than were the uh, geopolitics of the Cold War that was so uh, of such concern in the uh, in the West at that time and in the Soviet Union too. The Soviet participant 
was very uh, uh, pre concerned. Uh, one has to situate this project shortly after the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, where lots of people felt uh, that it was just a matter of luck that there didn't occur a breakdown of the sort that would have produced World War III. So there was a lot of anxiety in the North and the West and a kind of detachment from this anxiety among those uh, in Latin America, India, uh, and uh, uh, China, uh, and even to some extent by the, uh, uh, the, the European participant who was Johann Galtung, mm -hmm. who was, uh, had a sort of uh, uh, cosmic kind of orientation toward these issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what this, this, this brings us nicely to one of the features of your scholarship, Richard, that I find absolutely fascinating. Um, it, it, like you said, a lot of the other participants at WOMP, they focused so extensively on what Galtung himself called a uh, kind of a negative piece, a piece against war. Your own conception of world order uh, is uh, much more comprehensive. Um, it has this holistic focus to it. Um, you argue unapologetically and compellingly for the recognition of the causal interconnectedness of the primary risks confronting humanity. War is there for you, but so is poverty, oppression, environmental deterioration, uh, and, and, and others. Um, and furthermore, in analyzing these many challenges, you also propose holistic solutions that go beyond existing political forms. Um, this, 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 this holistic perspective in your landmark book, This Endangered Planet, you call the ecological perspective. Um, how did you first come to that perspective? And what was your inspiration for it? Well, that's a, a, a very probing question, Talia, and I'll do my best to uh, answer it. I think the, uh, the, the initial uh, urge, other than the fact that it was probably psychologically uh, appealing uh, to me and others, was the idea that if we were to make this WAMP project work, it had to combine these two sets of uh, interests, the, the, the interests in development and the interests in war and peace. And that uh, we learned very early on that if there was to be any political traction for a basic uh, changes in uh, how the world was organized, it would have to be holistic because there were such uh, diversities of circumstances and uh, cultural and civilizational orientations that it would uh, a a uh, an attractive uh, horizon would have to be comprehensive and in, your, in the sense you were using it, holistic. So that was the uh, initial feeling. It was of, uh, partly pragmatic and partly uh, uh, conceptual that in order to grapple with this uh, transformational uh, visionary uh, hope, uh, one needed this kind of uh, comprehensiveness. And uh, the it started off pre-ecologically, and I, I didn't have any real, uh, I, I'm responsible for bringing the environmental perspective into the WAM project as a result of my work on this endangered planet before it was published. And that also came about in a very strange way. I'd been very involved in imposing the Vietnam War, and I had come to, uh, I had come to the Stanford Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences for a year in which I was to uh, planning to pull together my writings on Vietnam uh, as uh, what I had proposed to do to, in order to get that fellowship. 
But maybe in the f first days or at least first week I was there, I had a conversation at the water cooler in the corridor with a Stanford physicist who convinced me that I was not exactly wasting my time, but that the world was in a, uh, an unrecognized crisis involving uh, uh, demographic population pressure, uh, uh, the four things that I focused on yes. uh, in the book. And I dropped my, my Vietnam project and uh, that's, that became uh, this endangered planet. And there was a kind of coincidence that uh, reinforced this development. And that was that the New York Times sent a, uh, their cultural uh, affairs writer to this uh, Stanford Center to interview a few, f I mean, to do a kind of feature story on the center and what were these uh, crazy academic people doing out there on the top of the hill uh, with no uh, no library and no students. And uh, he, ch for, uh, I don't know why, but he chose me as one of the four or five people he uh, spoke to and focused his article totally on this endangered planet uh, uh, perspective that I was uh, developing. And it it showed me the potency of the media because I must have had 22 offers from publishers within the next 10 days. That's extraordinary. And I've never had that experience since then, <laughs> uh, anything resembling that. And the uh, a head of Random House flew out to have breakfast with me. And it was an interesting total experience, and I had the... Uh, in order to lure me away from these other publishers, he offered me the uh, editor that William Faulkner had, so, <laughs> but, which turned out again to be one of those good things that turned out to be difficult because this man was very uh, much more uh, sort of a mainstream Cold, Cold War Southerner uh, who uh, felt the only thing worth worrying about was population. And so he was uh, as much an antagonist as a uh, helpful editor. But anyway, the book got finished and published. And uh, it came at the same time as the Club of Rome uh, study on uh, the limits, limits to growth. Um, one, one of the uh, interesting implications of the ecological perspective uh, that, that, that you outline in this endangered planet um, is, is, is the claim that um, it, it, as, as, as a consequence of modernity, uh, a, a state system is, is structurally incapable of sustaining uh, world order. Um, that would be capable of allowing um, a majority of the world's population to pursue their visions of the good life. Um, it, 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 it's not an argument that um, you, you see in the mainstream of international relations scholarship. Um, for example, in a recent piece, you write um, very powerfully uh, that the state system cannot close, quote, the gap between what is feasible, politics is the art of the possible, and what is necessary, protecting the peoples of the world against various forms of catastrophic harm, the basic structural deficiency, you say, is associated with the absence of effective means to uphold the global interest in situations where multilateralism as the aggregation of national interests is unable to produce sufficiently effective cooperative arrangements. Um, I, 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 this is a very interesting argument. Walk us through this, if you would. What, first of all, what are the desirable values that a decent world order should embody? What structural le reasons limit the ability of a state system to realize those values? And, and finally, why can't we rely on multilateral cooperation? For example, a cooperation guided by the enlightened self-interest of the great powers to uh, supply the want of these alternative architectures of world order. Uh, well, let me tr uh, try my best. That's a, uh, I, I know I'm responsible for that sentence you quoted, but it, it combines a lot it's of... It's quite a mouthful, uh, yes. Uh, quite, yes, quite distinct issues. 
And uh, there's an ambiguity uh, in the uh, in my own use of a, a state system or state centric world order, because it, uh, and it it goes to a lot of the issues I think that are uh, of interest to all three of you, uh, and that is that you really have two uh, two dimensions of uh, the Westphalian framework. Uh, which are not often uh, adequately distinguished, in my view. The first is, of course, the juridical uh, uh, notion of states as uh, equal participants in international life. And uh, uh, the idea that uh, once you are a sovereign state, you're part of a a uh, statist uh, form of governance in which there's a kind of equality. But then there's the uh, uh, other uh, dimension of Westphalia, which uh, I identify with geopolitics, which you referred to in terms of the great powers. And it's, can, it is, uh, rests on a uh, foundation of inequality and, and uh, that uh, tension between statism juridically conceived and geopol geopolitically implemented seems to me to be at the core of why uh, the system as now constituted and structured can't see solve these global scale issues, not only uh, the problems of climate change and the uh, issues associated with global migration, but also uh, nuclear weaponry and a whole series of other issues. And part of the this tension is that uh, is embodied in the United Nations itself where these five victorious states in World War II were given the right of veto and permanent membership in the only body that can make decisions. And by giving a right of veto, in effect, one is telling those five governments they only have to conform to the UN Charter or to international law when it's in their strategic interest to do so. There's no uh, legal compulsion. There's no even political commitment. And the constitutional order embodies this tension. And what that has meant is that you have a an architecture in international society in which the weak are potentially accountable while the strong and their friends enjoy impunity, double standards, and a, a, a kind of discretionary uh, field of political maneuver that encourages them to be, uh, to pursue the interests of their own population at the expense of uh, the global uh, global co common good or public good. The, another aspect of what you uh, asked, Talia, was the idea of enlightened self-interest. We're now in a period, you could argue, I think, that after World War II, the U.S. Uh, established a system of order that certainly had important elements of being enlightened. But what, what we now have seen is this unexpected drift toward uh, an illiberal uh, kind of world order in which ultranationalism prevails in almost every important state in the world. And so there's a 
instead of a responsiveness to the challenges of global scope, there is a uh, denial of their uh, very existence. And of course, Trump's America first uh, 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 worldview uh, is a kind of cartoonish exaggeration of these tendencies that are more uh, subtly uh, enacted by other actors in the world. So there's no enlightenment, in my view, uh, we're living in an existential moment where the striking feature of the state system in its dual uh, dimensions is the absence of enlightened interest. Uh, of enlightened uh, self-interest. Uh, I had some hopes for China at an earlier stage, but they too seem to be uh, pulled into this uh, uh, search for uh, maximum expansion of their own uh, interests at the uh, partial expense of others. I think they're less militarist than the US and the West uh, had been in its expansionist period and are more economistic in their approach to expansion. But nevertheless, they don't seem to be either motivated or capable of providing the kind of enlightened leadership that the world desperately needs at this stage. I'm not sure how much of your question I, I uh, responded to, Talia, but no, Richard, this is this, this is fascinating, um, and and it is it is quite compelling. I I, I do have I do have uh, a, f a few follow up questions about uh, the, the 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 shape of alternative world order that that would be preferable for you, and I want to get into that in a moment. But but I think the the we, we should linger a bit more on the subject of enlightened self-interest and how far enlightened self-interest can carry us and where we can expect to see it. I think that's something that's very close to John's own work. Yeah, it, it, uh, let, let me just say one thing. I, it occurred to me while I was making my answer that John could make a better answer than I could. <laughs> no, not at all, but I, I do want to uh, follow up on your, your very interesting response and Tolia's provocation uh, about Westphalia. And I, it is kind of a question I've had over the years about how the kind of intellectual theoretical camp that I've kind of made my own, the kind of liberal international camp, so to speak, which uh, uh, with, with differs and in, in, in what ways with uh, your particular take on Westphalia. I mean, in some sense, I, I see the, the liberal vision as as building on Westphalia and perhaps your vision of trying to envisage a post-Westphalian international order. And I'm just wondering whether that's that's right. Uh, I guess on the liberal side, uh, the, the, we both kind of live under the shadow of 1648. We're, we're, we're trying to figure out how uh, global scope problems can be uh, tackled with different kinds of global political formations. And I, I guess the liberal view puts a kind of up, upward limit to some extent on what the unified global system might look like. It, it, it's kind of, a, I guess you'd say, a, a vision of, of building on Westphalia. So the liberals of the, of the 20th century were uh, working with Westphalia. The Westphalian system, in some sense, was seen as a progressive force. Um, it was in some sense a substitute to a world built around empire. So that's that's a progressive step, a self-determination, um, uh, democratic rights and protections anchored as John Stuart Mill would have it in, in the nation state or Mazzini, the kind of liberal nationalism as a con constructive building block for, for a global system. Uh, and then a kind of evolutionary logic the liberal view has of of, of incremental ratcheting up of more multilateralism, greater institutionalized cooperation, um, but it's a kind of ultimately at the end of the door, at the end of the day, it's an intergovernmentalism 
built on a sovereign equality norms embedded in Westphalia, but it's trying to, to strengthen the fabric of the international system within rather than be, uh, working in a, in a kind of post-Westphalian framework. So I, I guess my question is, how do you, how does your conception differ from that? And, and because Westphalia is so important in your work over many, many decades, has there been any evolution in your own thinking about, is it the problem? Is, is it a reform agenda that I want? Or is it more of a, of a, of a revolutionary transformation in the underpinnings? Uh, because I can read you in different ways. Uh, yes, and uh, I, I can do the same. Uh, <laughs> uh, see, I, I uh, agree with you that uh, uh, liberalism uh, is a evolutionary continuation of uh, the way in which the world system uh, uh, emerged. And of course, in its uh, earliest uh, phases, it was quite consistent with a, uh, uh, a somewhat benevolent uh, f formation for the West or for Europe and uh, a, a subordination and, and exploitation of the rest of the world. And it it uh, it only after these in the twentieth century, I think, uh, accepted the idea that of the juridical uh, strengthening this juridical side of uh, uh, yes. liberalism and uh, uh, somewhat uh, constraining uh, the. Uh, the geopolitical side, which also was constrained by the weakening of the West, uh, especially the uh, colonial West or the imperial West, uh, through the two world wars and the rise of uh, nationalism in other parts of the world that challenged uh, the these uh, uh, ex the the attempts the successful attempts by the West to control the non-West. And I think we're still, uh, and the Middle East is a good uh, 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 cauldron of the, this uh, uh, unresolved uh, uh, resolution, the unresolved uh, transition uh, from a uh, imperial world order to a more genuinely statist uh, world order. And uh, it uh, was victimized, in my view, by the peace diplomacy after uh, World War I, uh, a lot of the problems. That, uh, so in that sense, uh, I have a lot of problems with how you characterize Westphalia and in what period, and then also uh, the issue of the historicity of Westphalia. It was one thing in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. It became something else, I think, in the 20th century. And now with this resurgent autocracy and nationalism, it's become something else uh, in the 21st century. And it's particularly dysfunctional from the point of view of species survival in the 21st century. Because you have, as I tried to suggest earlier, you have governments that are refusing to follow a, a path of functional problem solving, let alone normative uh, in, uh, reform in the world. So it, it's, uh, it seems to me to be uh, doubly regressive at this stage and uh, uh, suffers from the uh, absence of historically relevant enlightened leadership. 
and and uh, the the uh, decline of the U.S., which I uh, relate very much to the failure to learn the lessons of, uh, especially the Vietnam War, that militarism doesn't work in the way it did in the colonial era, and the effort to maintain this global security system under American uh, leadership has been a uh, disaster leading to not only relative decline of the U.S., uh, but also a series of uh, destructive wars that didn't achieve their political objectives. I mean, the, uh, uh, the military instrument cannot really prevail even when it has the benefit of military superiority which I felt was the primary lesson of the Vietnam War and to some degree of the earlier Korean War. But it was a lesson that could not be learned by the American policy community because it had become itself militarized and subject to uh, so-called military industrial complex pressures that meant that it had to uh, uh, form policy in a way that didn't challenge uh, the militarist uh, uh, understanding of security. And uh, the second thing I would point to, and it may be a difference in our uh, thinking about these issues, John, is that the, the West and the liberal international order suffered by winning the Cold War. I know that sounds paradoxical, but what I mean is that once capitalism lost the uh, the challenge of socialism in in its various guises and forms, it moved toward a rather extreme ver version of itself, and yes. uh, and uh, privileged capital efficiency over uh, the well-being of people and in that sense uh, yes. is partially accountable for neoliberal globalization which in turn produced this uh, degree of alienation coming from inequalities of various sorts so that I think that uh, the this uh, problem of not adjusting to the outcome of the Cold War in a positive and creative way, as was yes. done after World War II, is one of the things that has, that explains this uh, very serious decline of global leadership, and particularly uh, the U.S. role in providing that leadership. Yes, yes. I didn't. I didn't get to your uh, Westphalia, post Westphalia, but uh, because I think at this point we're uh, so struggling with uh, a kind of regressive Westphalia uh, that the first priority may be to restore Westphalia before uh, uh, thinking too hard about uh, post Westphalia. Although yes. you can argue dialectically that uh, this deterioration might give rise to a uh, series of contradictions that produces something that's either much better or much worse. Yes, yes. I want to pick up on that last point you just made about alienation being one of the basic political problems of world order today. Um, and I, I guess just to set up that question, um, would it not be correct to say that there are basically two facets um, to your uh, critique um, of a Westphalian state system? There is a kind of a, a familiar uh, efficiency standpoint critique, which says that um, due to collective action problems, uh, states will not be able to 
act upon the global interest, even when that global interest is self-evident, but will instead attempt to uh, pursue their own partial interest, even to the detriment of the global interest. Um, but then there is also a more normative side to your critique of Westphalia, and that normative side says in effect that um, the Westphalian state system hasn't been conducive uh, to the uh, crafting um, of narratives and, and rituals um, and, and, and spiritual points of reference that allow people on the ground to find meaning for themselves in the system. Um, as, um, as, you, as you put it uh, in one of my favorite passages, in this endangered planet. You say, in order for us to go forward, quote, we need to invent new images, new rituals, new symbols and myths, new models of world societies, and new conceptions of plausibility and fulfillment, or revive old ones that could serve our needs, end quote. And let me put this as a question to you then. If the problem of world order is not exhausted by familiar analysis of suboptimalities and inefficiencies, but touches crucially on these more spiritual problems, uh, these more normative problems, that if not resolved satisfactorily, result in a profound sense of social alienation, um, then what intellectual traditions and spiritual resources would be fruitful for us in crafting progressive change going forward? Uh, well, I, I, again, that's a, a very uh, challenging question, and I think the uh, uh, place where I would begin is uh, the revival of the pre-modern uh, understandings of the relationship of uh, human society with its natural surroundings. I, and I think uh, many have... Uh, observed this, that indigenous people were much more uh, sensitive to their own dependence on some kind of uh, co-evolutionary or harmonious uh, uh, connections with uh, nature and with uh, uh, the non-human species that inhabit the planet. And what modernity did was to uh, have this uh, consciousness that nature was there to be exploited. It was the what one might call the uh, non-human ecological proletariat that was uh, uh, not uh, not a subject but an object. And I think that. Uh, led to, uh, that underpins this uh, degree of alienation and otherness that uh, certainly contributed to the rapid uh, rise of uh, economic standards in the industrializing, modernizing world. And again, if one looks at recent history, the remarkable transformation of the uh, East Asian countries in this period is, is something uh, that is both a kind of, uh, uh, what shall I say, a extreme uh, validation of how to, uh, how modern modernization can end poverty and hardship and the alienating impact that it has uh, through this disregard of the uh, subjecthood or the need to, to uh, create some kind of sustainable uh, set of connections uh, with nature. As far as uh, the other part of the response, is what I, it, it rests really on that distinction I mentioned earlier between uh, functional problem solving uh, and 
uh, normative uh, horizons, both of which I feel are uh, important and uh, almost indispensable. The functional problem solving is a sense uh, th that uh, in some degree this pandemic has uh, reinforced for many people, and that is we're all in this together. And that in that sense, the this boundary, the spatial boundaries of states are very misleading and artificial. And that to really create a world order that is capable of solving the problems that this high degree of interconnectedness has generated uh, requires that kind of uh, identity that shifts at least uh, a lot of its uh, energies and resources away from uh, the nation state and towards some kind of uh, wider, more inclusive uh, form of political community. I think Europe, try, Europe uh, ironically invented Westphalia, but also pioneered a, an experimental effort to create a post-Westphalian regional order. It's now, I think, in a, also in a somewhat stagnant or even regressive phase, but it, it, there, there was a recognition uh, after World War II that states were not sufficient to deal effectively with the economic and uh, political challenges and later the uh, environmental challenges that late modernity was producing. Uh, so, so that 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 kind of creation of wider communities, and in that sense, uh, the response to Huntington's clash of civilizations was this Spanish. Uh, Turkish initiative about alliance of civilizations and the notion that you need these inter-civilizational inputs going back to the ideas that I mentioned uh, as put forward by Northrop way, in, uh, way back in the 1940s and 50s, uh, there, there is that need for a uh, ethical foundation that is both uh, builds on the human rights tradition, which I think is one of the uh, very important achievements of late uh, liberalism and uh, the post-World War II uh, developments and was uh, attributed in part to the activism of non-governmental uh, uh, organizations or civil society organizations. And it was also helped by uh, the Cold War atmosphere, which led the West to want to show that it was uh, normatively superior uh, as a way of organizing political and economic life to that which the Soviet Union was associated with. So one of the ways of showing the uh, normative inferiority of uh, uh, Soviet bloc was to point to its human rights deficiencies. And that was then picked up by uh, uh, Carter, uh, Jimmy Carter on the US side after the Vietnam failure as showing uh, that the US was not just a defeated military uh, actor, but it also uh, could uh, be a normative leader. And his promotion of human rights uh, was the sort of signature uh, uh, identifying feature of uh, his presidency until the Iranian revolution in 1978, 70, early 79, where it became clear 
that by promoting human rights, you might ha have to accept strategic setbacks. And that led to the U.S. backing away from human rights, including Carter and Brzezinski, who was the national security advisor at the time. And I happened to be in Iran during the uh, uh, revolution at the, at the very moment when the Shah left the country and uh, Khomeini came. And many of the leading personalities there said, we thought Washington gave us a green light. And it, you got the impression that they wouldn't have acted as vigorously against the Shah had they not felt that the, their agenda of ending uh, oppression from uh, the Shah's Iran was part of why uh, they were willing to take the risks of uh, being uh, killed and uh, uh, dealing with a, uh, an, a, a Pahlavi dynasty that wasn't willing to make reforms or give up power. I don't know if I wandered too far from your question, uh, tell you. Uh, not at all. In fact, um, if uh, you permit me a brief aside, I think one of the qualities of your scholarship um, that so readily stands out to people who uh, appreciate your work and who admire and savor your work um, is this very clear sense um, that your positions and your arguments are animated by a deep sense of personal engagement with the underlying issues. So to be able to uh, draw away the curtain, so to speak, to, to get an inside peek um, at the uh, stories that, 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 that formed your opinions on some of these issues is really quite fascinating. Um, but I wonder if I can ask you to specify in more detail your vision of preferred world order and its institutional architectures. Um, if Westphalia doesn't work, uh, then what does work and what should work? Uh, and just to set this question up, I think it would be a fair assessment to say that for most people who come to the rubric of world order studies for the first time, the almost instinctive alternative to an anarchic Westphalian state system um, is some form of world federalism, world government. Now, although some of your colleagues at WOMP embraced uh, different forms of world federalism, you remained conspicuously skeptical of the feasibility of world government, uh, as well as worried by the political implications of world federalism for individual liberty. Um, could you offer us a broad outline of the designs for world order that you favored at that time? And could you also perhaps indicate to us whether recent world historical and technological developments, such as the um, end of the Cold War or the development of supersonic weapons, prompted you to change those designs in any way? Uh, yes. Uh, le let me uh, begin by... Uh addressing this uh, part of the question of uh, s sort of what went, uh, what went wrong uh, with uh, this sense that uh, federalism and world government offered at least uh, conceptually or uh, intellectually a solution. What went wrong in my mind with that way of thinking? And it was partly that this was a uh, such a distinctly Western and U.S. view that it, it uh, seemed to me that it would not have political traction in a decolonizing world where most of the peoples of the world were so happy to finally achieve at least the formal uh, features of political independence and national sovereignty. So I thought the historical situation was very uh, uh, adverse to thinking that you could uh, induce other parts of the world, especially the non-Western parts of the world, to, uh, to go along with something 
uh, that called for this uh, greater centralization of authority uh, at the global level. And that was combined with a more cynical view that this Western advocacy, uh, which is sort of in a, a certain form of ultra-liberalism, uh, was really a disguised uh, scenario for global domination because the degree of material and diplomatic and cultural hegemony that already existed would be generalized in such a way uh, that the uh, uh, non-Western world, or, or at least uh, most of the non-Western world, would in effect or existentially be recolonized under the uh, banner of world federalism. So that it, uh, it seemed to me that it was uh, both uh, not uh, politically saleable, nor was it given the uh, ideologies that prevailed in capitalism and in nationalism and the inequalities of power that existed, that it was not something that it, even if there was receptivity in other parts of the world, it would be a disuto dystopia, not a utopia. So that, that uh, sort of explains why I was against that. Then the question becomes, well, what can you do that is more than uh, fixing up uh, uh, the Westphalian system as uh, John d uh, earlier uh, described it, uh, and I agree with uh, the uh, there. There has the, what what seems to me to be enlightenment within that Westphalian framework is what I would call normative incrementalism, where you can do certain things that are uh, seem quite. Uh, far-reaching, like establish an international criminal court or create these uh, frameworks for uh, responsibility to protect people that are vulnerable but uh, and create an international criminal law. But you can't, uh, the, the uh, liberal order, in my view, uh, is unable to implement in a way that corresponds with a global rule of law, uh, the essence of which is that equals should be treated equally. And we can look at the whole history of the attempt to extend criminal accountability uh, to, uh, the, from the end of World War II to the present moment when uh, World War II ended, uh, German and Japanese uh, surviving military and civilian leaders were prosecuted as war criminals, but the victor's uh, behavior was uh, exempt from even scrutiny, much less uh, investigation and potential prosecution. It was victor's justice which in a way is a metaphor for the geopolitical dimension of Westphalia. And, and that, that kind of uh, uh, geopolitical uh, characteristic is, is recently uh, illustrated by the, uh, what shall I call it, the the arrogance of the U.S. imposing sanctions on the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court because they dare investigate very well-evidenced allegations of American war crimes in Afghanistan and also the Israeli uh, crimes uh, associated with the occupied Palestinian territories. So uh, w this idea that, that it is uh, 
somehow a such a uh, departure from the international order to investigate uh, U.S. U.S. conduct in a combat situation uh, that it deserves sanctions of those that are carrying out their official responsibilities. Whereas when Saddam Hussein and Iraq were, uh, uh, when there was regime change after 2003, the U.S. sent in a hundred lawyers to prepare prosecutions of the Saddam Hussein and his entourage uh, with, without even acknowledging that uh, the U.S. had been responsible for what, from an international law point of view, looked like a war of aggression by attacking uh, Iraq without uh, any claim of self-defense. So uh, what I'm trying to uh, say is that this quality of uh, completely marginalizing uh, the uh, responsibility of the geopolitical actors to conform to the legal and moral order uh, is such a fundamental deficiency that it would require a, a global movement to overcome. And, uh, and to overcome it, I think, uh, on the one level by uh, democratizing uh, the leading uh, political actors, the leading states in the world in such a way that they are enlightened in a 21st century, uh, her, uh, uh, 21st century imaginary, that they see the historical circumstances as they exist today with the, with the challenges and the uh, uh, technological uh, uh, environment that creates this uh, interconnectedness, whether it's wanted or not wanted, and where uh, temporal boundaries are as important or more important than spatial boundaries. And again, the Westphalia and particularly liberal democracies and corporate financial sectors of uh, state operations are maladjusted to the needs of the time. The uh, short-term uh, electoral cycles means that politicians are benefited, or at least they think they're benefited, by and large by ignoring the long-term unless there's a uh, powerful lobby that uh, reshapes uh, priorities. In other words, weapon systems are developed with a long-term vision of 50 years, 75 years. Support for unconditional support for Israel or Saudi Arabia seems to be uh, not subject to this short-termism. So I think unless you transcend these problematic features of the present uh, functioning of Westphalian world order, uh, the possibility of transition to a better system through intergovernmental initiatives seems close to zero as far as I can tell. It sounds to me in, in that case that um, the very the very experiment of trying to devise alternative arrangements for world order on the assumption that this um, normative incrementalism, as you called it, is all that we can hope for reasonably for uh, from Westphalia at, at the present moment, then 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 the very uh, exercise of trying to imagine alternatives is is, is a bit utopian. 
And that's indeed the criticism of your early arguments um, uh, in this endangered planet um, that Hedley Bull leveled uh, very, very persuasively in his book, The, the Anarchical Society. Hedley Bull, of course, was one of your uh, eminent interlocutors. And, and he um, uh, argued, putting the point quite brusquely, the comparison of alternative utopias is an arbitrary and sterile ec- exercise, he said. And he then encouraged students of international politics to, quote, make the state system viable. So in, 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 in your earlier work, um, you, you argued that there is room in thinking about world order for rooted utopianism. Against the sterile utopianism of Bull, there is the rooted utopianism of Richard Falk. Um, and, and you argued that unless aspirations are convincingly associated with the transformation of politics, their assertion is more like a cry of despair than a serious political undertaking, but but it almost sounds like now your 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 belief in the possibility of a substantial transformation of politics, at least in the short to medium terms, um, are, are are quite small. So are we are we in effect limited by Westphalia for the foreseeable future? Uh, uh, that that would be the most uh, plausible uh, response, but but for me an inadequate one. Uh, I should say that. Uh, Hedley Bull was a close friend, and part of his introduction to an Arctic society urges people to come to terms with the WAMP perspectives. He's not altogether uh, uh, negative about it, though the, uh, he had an acerbic uh, turn of phrase at times. But that's uh, not the main point. Also, I would say that even... Uh, normative incrementalism in the present world context is quasi-utopian or or un, uh, unlikely to be to occur in in uh, any uh, significant form. What I've been trying to say recently, in recognition, really, of what uh, the the way you phrase the question is that we need to recognize two things. One is this gap between what is feasible and what is necessary. And that creates a situation which, if not addressed, leads to a collective disaster. So I uh, recognize the uh, realist critique of going beyond where we presently are, but I also uh, confirm what I would call the ecological critique that we can't hope for a benevolent future unless we transcend these constraints. And so I've been trying to articulate what I call a a politics of impossibility based on the fact that we can't know the future. The future is unknowable and that we should struggle for what we believe is necessary and desirable. So in addition to the horizon of necessity, I also emphasize what I call the horizon of desire and uh, take the uh, sort of Gramscian view uh, uh, that is pes- the, uh, being uh, a pessimist of the intellect but a optimist of the will and feel that since we can't know the future and we need a different kind of future, uh, we have to, in effect, advocate what I've recently been calling a necessary utopianism. It's, in a sense, uh, more susceptible on one level to the kind of uh, Headley, Headley Bull critique, but on the other hand, it's more responsive to the fact that the uh, realist horizons are uh, leading us toward a deeper and deeper dysutopia, a dystopian future. 
So the the uh, alternatives, as I see it, is a uh, dystopian slide toward catastrophe, a bioethical ecological crisis that will be uh, un, uh, unfixable, and a uh, politics of impossibility resting on a necessary utopianism, acknowledging that politics can no longer be seen as the, the uh, art of the possible, but must become the art of the impossible or the design of the impossible. Mm, that's very well put. Chica? Yeah, I wonder if I could just dig a bit further then into your process of conceptualizing these alternative visions of world order, especially for something like WUMP, um, because you mentioned that the future is unknowable. So I wonder, were there any issues or situations um, whose future trajectories seem particularly uncertain to you at the time? Uh, well, at the time, of course, uh, one one aspect of that I attempted to address by my uh, critique of uh, world federalism and world government. Uh, and another was this reduction of uh, international relations to uh, bipolarity and the securitization of political life. Uh, those, those two uh, kinds of uh, futures seem to me to be so to cast such a dark shadow over uh, the the evolu evolution of humanity organized political life uh, that i uh, tried over this years to sort of uh, articulate what seemed to me to be a, uh, what shall I call it, a uh, uh, cosmopolitan humanism and, and what that implied in terms of uh, a culture of human rights that would apply to the strong as well as the weak, rule of law that embodied the idea of treating equals equally and extended to uh, global behavior, a, a, uh, a greater sense of empathy for uh, suffering of others, both within one's own society and throughout the world. All of those elements lead to procedures, policies, and institutions that seem to me to be uh, uh, so desirable that if they were, if the political will was there to enact them, it would create a post-Westphalian uh, political consciousness. And yes, I guess then I'm interested then in, in how you exactly go about navigating between these improbabilities on the one hand and these normative certainties on the other. Um, and I asked this partly because prior to our conversation today, um, I came across a transcript of an old interview given by Saul Mendelowitz, your former WOMP colleague that you mentioned earlier, in which he mentioned the difference of opinion between the two of you. Um, and he said that whilst he was keen to discuss details of institutional design, you tended to push back against what you called premature specificity. So do you think designing alternative world orders necessarily demands a fair or even high level of abstraction? Uh, yeah, yes, I, I think that uh, my argument at that time was that it was so uh, improbable that one would uh, get to the point where one was uh, really uh, establishing world government of some sort, which he favored, uh, that if it were to happen, it would be uh, a result of, of a political context that would itself shape the institutional architecture. 
And therefore, unless you anticipated the political context to rely on the present context, which made it uh, both, as I, I, from my point of view, both uh, highly improbable, improbable to the point of being not worth serious reflection, to being undesirable because of the implications of uh, global hegemony, even global tyranny, uh, arising out of some effort to impose that kind of uh, centralization of authority. But I just felt it was a regressive exercise to do more than suggest some vague form of uh, central guidance that would deal with the functional challenges facing humanity. And one of the functional challenges that preoccupied me from a very early uh, stage was the uh, issue of nuclear weapons and the uh, fact that they had the capability of uh, catastrophic uh, ending of civilization as we knew it, and they didn't respect boundaries that the whole uh, notion of war between uh, states was obsolete in the nuclear age. And so that uh, led me to this uh, idea that uh, one had to think in a radical way about how to uh, deal with uh, the war system to begin with. And in some ways, I think my pessimism about the Westphalian approach has been validated because what we've learned to live with is a system that I characterize as nuclear apartheid, where a small group of countries uh, possess, develop, and are seem prepared to use these weapons at moments of their own choice, while the rest of the world, the non-nuclear countries, are not only uh, uh, prohibited from acquiring the weaponry, but they're uh, subject to uh, uh, aggression if they're seen as approaching uh, nuclear thresholds, as is the case, for instance, currently with Iran and long been the case with relation to uh, North Korea. And it's, it's a, uh, uh, it seems to me that, that, that nuclear apartheid is a metaphor for what I see, feel has gone terribly wrong with the uh, recent evolution of the Westphalian system, given the technological innovations since, uh, since uh, the advent of uh, nuclear weapons. Should I jump in here? I, I, um, yeah, I, I, and I think Chica's going to follow up with a question that I'm going to pose, which is, I think we're kind of moving to the question, to, I would say the kind of the the discussion of sort of what is your theory of change? What how, what what are the agents? What are the, the the logics of transformation that are embedded in your work and in your vision? Uh, there's clearly a, a notion, as you suggest, of normative incrementalism of, of 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 transformations over the long term in the way humans think about their plight and their and possibilities. You're not optimistic that a lot of uh, sudden movement in a in a post Westphalian uh, wor to a post Westphalian world is possible, but there's a there is a sense that that uh, actors uh, with uh, a sense of the the stakes can move us forward in some sense. So what 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 is who are the agents who are the uh, who are the actors in your in your uh, understanding of, of how we get from here to there. Um, and uh, the one way I've tried to play with that question is, were you to look back over the last thousand years uh, at transformations in world politics, revolutions uh, of 
of how humans live, uh, ideally uh, revolutions that have had a progressive dimension, what in the past would you look to to, to help uh, illuminate future transformations? It, 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 have we been here before? There have been technological uh, changes, the, the existential threats of your eras called forth a politics uh, uh, in various ways at various places. Is there anything in our history that helps inform how this next uh, period of our global plight will unfold? What, what in the best of circumstances, who and what will be pushing us forward? Uh, let me let me try, uh, John. That's a very uh, challenging uh, question, of course. And I would put it under uh, the uh, sort of uh, formal banner of saying, uh, by and large, people, not elites, make fundamental changes. And uh, and if we look at uh, the kinds of changes that have occurred in in uh, the recent past, they've all been, in my view, responsive to uh, uh, movements from below, not from the established order. Uh, if one thinks of the uh, Iranian Revolution of 78, 79, even the Arab Spring, uh, now the uh, uh, challenges posed in the U.S. by Black Lives Matter, the civil rights movement, and they they seem to involve uh, both a kind of uh, underlying set of conditions, somewhat similar to a uh, dry uh, forest area where a spark can set off an, imme an immense conflagration. Uh, the incident that set off the Arab Spring, for instance, was uh, uh, overthrowing a vegetable, uh, uh, a street vegetable seller who didn't have a proper permit in a remote town in Tunisia back in two the end of 2010. The Iranian Revolution was also uh, initiated by a, a very, what seemed like a very small incident in which uh, the uh, government uh, killed a few demonstrators in a, a, a town, not, not in Tehran, but in a secondary town. So I think that uh, mm -hmm. the, a, a smoldering underlying condition combined with the uh, 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 some kind of charismatic element is often important. Like Martin Luther King, I think, was very important to the success of the civil rights movement. And, uh, the, uh, and sometimes the charismatic uh, impact is of an event like the police uh, killing of George Floyd in, the, uh, in, in America's recent past. In other words, something that gives shape to, a, uh, to an underlying set of grievances that may not even be articulated well and may may not produce uh, enduring change. Uh, uh, in, in that sense, the Arab Spring generated a counter-revolution which probably resulted in a, a increasing oppression rather than emancipation from oppression. Whereas the Iranian Revolution uh, stabilized itself, but uh, by uh, also adopting uh, uh, quite oppressive techniques. So the uh, I think there's no 
uh, realistic hope of change other than through uh, some kind of uh, movement from below. I think Sanders tried to do this in the U.S. Uh, with uh, a frustrating outcome. In a way, the Tea Party on the right wing tried its uh, uh, tried to do the same with more more political success. Unfortunately, uh, but what I uh, unless there is this kind of radicalism rooted in popular uh, uh, dissatisfaction, where people are prepared to uh, uh, risk their lives and confront the established order, elites will at best do the incremental and at worst will engage as current political uh, developments suggest in regressive uh, adaptation to the uh, present realities. So I place my hope on the unexpected energies that are uh, that that exist below the surface of politics. There's a um, interesting passage in the, uh, I believe it's the second epilogue of Tolstoy's War and Peace, in which he asks the question, "Why do historians always get history wrong?" And his response there is that historians look at the surface of things, whereas the uh, history moves by these surges from below, these systemic earthquakes, in effect, that disrupt the uh, established uh, expectations about what is possible. And that's why I'm... use this uh, provocative language of the politics of impossibility. Thank you. Uh, that's terrific. Uh, Chika, do you want to? Sh- sure. Um, if I just ask you to contextualize something like WOMP within the historical landscape of political movements um, to transform the world, how successful was ultimately uh, it, it's hard to, it depends how one evaluates success. Of course, in terms of the world as we experience it, it was a total failure. The Everything that WAMP hoped for has more or less uh, diminished, and the fears that it uh, had about uh, un, uh, regressive tendencies have been more or less Uh, realized. On the other hand, the fact that we're talking about it is in one sense uh, a suggestion that from a discursive point of view, it did have uh, some some things that seem and still seem relevant to say. And uh, if you adopt the kind of Hegelian view that ideas are what ultimately uh, make history and are, in one sense, going back to John's question, last question, uh, are in a way the agents of history. It may be that some of the uh, uh, underlying perspectives of the WAMP undertaking, the fact of bringing together the diverse strands of uh, civilizational uh, uh, worldview and seeking uh, peace and justice and environmental sustainability. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that that kind of discourse is one that would uh, be very fruitful uh, to have under current historical conditions. Yes, Dick, I, I, I've found many of your your terms very evocative and helpful and um, inspiring even. Um, and one 
one that has always kind of hit me is your notion of pilgrim, uh, which is used as you've suggested uh, to connote a, an allegiance to a, a political or a global uh, order that actually doesn't exist, but but in some sense your solidarity with that imagined future provides a kind of identity for you and agenda, a kind of a purpose of direction for your work. Uh, and that um, in itself provides, will allow you to have the impact that you have. Uh, could you say a little bit more about, about that concept and 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 how it's tied to your again to your 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 argument about how we make change you you've made it very clear this kind of social movement underlying societal transformations that come from a kind of radicalism a popular radicalism that is perhaps led by by uh, charismatic uh, figures who galvanize it but um the citizen pilgrim is a kind of as a more kind of a, a lonelier kind of connotation, a kind of the intellectual speaking truth to power, um, uh, um, uh, articulating the nature of the of the of the moment we live in. Uh, so, so if when you say something about Citizen Pilgrim, what I w wanted to hear a little bit about was what is the role of the intellectual of the uh, of the scholar activist uh, in your larger vision of movement from here to there? Uh, good. Uh, I, I, I very much share the way you uh, pose the, this uh, question. And, and it might be helpful for me to say that somewhat parallel to my reaction to world government, my initial attraction to the citizen pilgrim imagery was a reaction to uh, claims of world citizenship mm. because uh, I was uh, I felt that it was a an idea that lacked any meaningful political traction and seemed to imply that you could be a citizen in a world uh, order that lacked community mm. See, and, and uh, part of uh, what I feel the Citizen Pilgrim is dedicated to creating a future in which there is a world community, mm -hmm. you, that you can't take it as a premise, but rather as a, a goal or objective. And that this uh, su suggested to me also uh, the idea that you needed to uh, be active in the pursuit of the desired and necessary future. That it was uh, not something that good wishes and good values could achieve. That in that sense, uh, as you put it uh, well, uh, that uh, scholarship for me involved engaged citizenship. Mm -hmm. And engaged citizenship involved a certain degree of activism. And uh, I found that even epistemologically very uh, uh, helpful in understanding myself in a, in a way. So that it, uh, the, the uh, initial essence of Citizen Pilgrim uh, was to establish a more authentic uh, political identity for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I did find that it, it was a idea that other people uh, seemed to like, and uh, so it has had a certain uh, uh, life of its own beyond my uh, own efforts to uh, crystallize what it means to be a quote unquote public intellectual and uh, how that has uh, affected uh, what I've uh, done with my life. And therefore, it was very much involved in this memoir writing 
a experience of mine. Mm -hmm. Toya? Um, yes, um, Richard, I, I want to ask you a question. Um, I guess it's going to be our last question um, that will tie together uh, the many threads um, of this fascinating conversation. Um, and it's a question that relates to uh, the last chapter of this endangered planet, um, where you posit uh, of the now the, the book was published in 1970. It was first published in 70. And as, as a grad student, when I first came across this book, I um, the back by acute by the prescience of your publications in that chapter. In that chapter, you posit two visions of the future. In the first vision, the impairs of ecological politics and uh, the, the holistic approach to world order that you argue for, they heeded by the stakeholders uh, of politics, and a structural transformation in the architectures of world order uh, then follows, and it is accompanied by the emergence of a global civil society. And, and what we get in that one vision is humanity finding a sort of an equilibrium, a meaningful equilibrium amongst themselves, but also with nature. And then you have this very unsettling second vision. And in that second vision, looking into the future decade by decade, you chart how the imperatives of ecological politics are first disregarded, and then our species finds itself transitioning through decades of politics of what you call despair and desperation, until finally in the 21st century, we uh, find ourselves faced with the politics of catastrophe. Um, it, it, it is a remarkably prescient chapter, and I encourage our listeners to take a look at it. Um, the, the question that I want to put to you is, um, looking at these two scenarios now with the benefit of hindsight in 2020, um, have we, would you say, uh, as a species, um, allowed that second scenario that finished with the politics of catastrophe to unfold in its full, um, whether through malice, ignorance, or fatigue? And if so, would you say that there is reason for hope for us today as we stand beleaguered by the old risks that you analyzed while still at want and these new risks um, that have, in a way, uh, solidified the hold of Westphalia on the present political imagination? Wow. <laughs> that is a challenge. Uh, I would say, first of all, that the uh, optimistic or positive part of that uh, last chapter of this endangered planet uh, expressed uh, in my own uh, personal development a, uh, a touch too much of uh, a faith in the rational nature of the human condition, that rationality would triumph. And, and uh, I, I, in that sense, I, I suppose I would have cast myself not as a citizen pilgrim, but as a child of the Enlightenment. And that the, what I saw, these uh, uh, very devastating trends as posing threats, that I thought the rational uh, sensibilities of elites, uh, as well as of uh, people throughout the world, would create this kind uh, of uh, responsiveness. And I, I, I really believe that that was possible and even probable, uh, but I didn't know how it would happen. I mean, I, I had an agnosticism about uh, the ways in which it would happen. Uh, and I, a part of the agnosticism was the negative uh, scenario, uh, which said, uh, which in a way was an elaboration of the uh, uh, faith in rationality. I, in effect, said, if you're, if if the human species is not rational in its response to these trends, then this is what's going to happen, and we certainly don't want this to happen. Uh, since then. <coughs> I've become uh, more skeptical about whether the species, as distinct from individuals, has a collective will to survive. I've written an essay to that effect, which is the last chapter of my uh, most recent book called P Power Shift, uh, in which I, I, I put it as a question, does the human species 
have a will to survive. And I think one would say that the evidence up to now does not give us a very encouraging uh, picture. Uh, and and so the, uh, to some extent, my later thinking is what one might call biopolitics rather than uh, straight politics, that there is something more fundamental than the political arrangements of the world that is part of the deteriorated and deteriorating situation that we face. And <clears throat> one, <clears throat> one of the uh, aspects of this is the way in which technology is likely to uh, be manipulated for the benefit of the established order involving automation and uh, artificial intelligence and robotics in ways that will uh, disempower people. So uh, I have a greater pessimism uh, than was expressed in the book due to the these two factors of the biological makeup of the human species and the uh, revolutionary implications of a dehumanizing and disempowering uh, group of technological innovations. Well, that is a very sober note to finish on. <laughs> yes, I was going to say, that, but I would say just in thanking uh, Dick for this wonderful two hours of conversation that uh, I still come away inspired and and if there is uh, to be um, uh, uh, enlightened F to save ourselves as a species, uh, it will entail working through the issues and, and following pathways that, that you, Richard, have, have uh, traveled over these decades. And so we are inspired by you. We are instructed by you. And I do think, despite the, the pessimism of the moment, uh, you do help us to at least hope for the possibility that the owl of Minerva will take flight <laughs> uh, uh, in time uh, to uh, give us uh, a, a, a world order in the future that will be more uh, ecologically and economically uh, just and and secure. So thank you so much, uh, Dick, for, for your time and Tolia and Chica, thank you as well. Um, any last thoughts from any of you before we just sign off? Well, le let me take the opportunity to uh, thank the three of you, uh, John, Tolia, and Chica, for challenging me in the best possible ways and uh, genuinely uh, making me do my best to reimagine world order. And so it's been a very a simulating experience for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Richard. I thank you very, very much.